I had never driven this 1965 Beetle, but just a couple of miles before I started taking it apart to restore it. After restoring the car and getting it back on the road and driving it, it drove just like it was on ice. At 60 miles an hour, it was a little scary. With just the slightest turn of the wheel, it would dart back and forth. Like I say, it felt exactly like you were driving on ice. Now, I did extensive research online to see if I could find others that had this kind of problem. And yes, I found plenty of people with the problem, but nobody actually had a cure. Uh, so, if I had not had the same problem with a 1978 Corvette that I bought new and that is a show car too, it drove the same way and what that turned out to be was the rear end was out of alignment. So what I expected to be true was true. The front end was in line, the rear end was in line, but the two were not in line with each other. The reason I know that is that I checked my tire wear after running it about 300 miles and the tire wear was perfect. But that darting, driving on ice sensation still existed. Of course you want to check your tire pressure first. And on radials, you can have a broken belt in a radial that can cause some very weird problems. From my experience, a broken belt will cause the car to kind of wag back and forth at 5 to 10 miles an hour. And through the years with 18 bugs, I've had uh, tires that could not be balanced because of a belt problem. Now, you may not agree with what I say here, and that's okay. I can stand criticism, but I'm 73. I've done this my whole life. And this worked for me, so maybe it'll work for you. In my videos, I always try to explain things in very basic terms for the beginner, so you experts out there, please bear with me. First, I'll go into several different ways you can line up a Volkswagen, and then I want to get into camber. And as you see in this photo here, the bottom of the tires, the front tires, are slightly more in than they are at the top. I don't know if you can tell it from this photo. I can, just a little bit. In lining up a VW Beetle, I like to get the tires as vertical as I can. And to do that, I take a nut while the weight of the car is on the ground. I put a nut under the spring plate and the stop. First, we'll try the plumb bob method to determine whether the front and rear axle are in square with each other. If all four wheels are the same distance from each other, you will have a perfect rectangle. I don't recommend using the plumb bob method on a lift because a lift can move around. I hung the plumb bob over the axle tubes, both front and rear, at the very outside edge of the tubes and made a mark on tape as you see here on my floor so you'll have four reference points when you're done measure front to rear on the left and the right sides the measurement on the left and right hand sides measuring this way front to rear should be the same then measure across as seen here if your measurements are the same then you have a perfect rectangle. Make four stiff wire pointers out of welding rod or coat hanger as shown here and bolt to the shock bracket. Be sure that these are perfectly vertical. Now using this method, much like the plumb bob method, you measure from front to rear from these pointers, hook your tape to it and measure and then measure crossways too. Here again, you should come up with equal measurements and you should have a perfect rectangle. Now my 65 Beetle was exactly one inch out. Now, why was this car one inch out? That's a good question. Either it's been bumped slightly in the front of the rear, or maybe it's just stacked tolerances, which means that uh, all the tolerances uh, add up to a difference. When I found out that this car was one inch out of square, so to speak, then the next obvious thing to, to do was to check for any kind of damage, anything I could see bent. 
as far as the axle tubes or the torsion bars and I saw nothing. And of course this is the stock slots as shown here. Now the next thing to do is to get the car aligned into a perfect rectangle and in order to do that I didn't have enough movement in the factory slots so I had to take my die grinder and then elongate the hole. To move the axle back to get your alignment, just stick a large screwdriver where the yellow arrow is there and you can pry the axle back. Now to go the other way with it, of course, you can take a big ball peen hammer and tap on the end of the axle housing. After I had made sure that I had a perfect rectangle, I drilled a little index mark as you see here to know that that was a starting point to start my rear end alignment. So now that I'm sure I have a perfect rectangle and I've made my reference marks, it's time to start the rear end alignment. I made an alignment tool as you can see here, but the downside is that it takes two people. And on the end of this adjustable tool are two pointers. I can use either one. In order to make a mark where I can make my measurements, I used a level and then I marked a place on the tire. I made this mark with a magic marker. Anything will work. The center seam on this BF Goodrich tire was perfect, so I didn't have to scribe a line around the tire. But yours probably won't be, so we'll go into that. With the tire a few inches off the ground, put a block or a brick close to the tire, and then use a screwdriver and have someone turn the tire for you while you scribe a line all the way around the tire to measure from. Now you place your alignment tool on the mark right on the money on that scribed line and do that on both the front and the rear of the tires until you get your alignment right which on above is 1 8 inch towed out. Not in but out. I put the weight of the car, to be more accurate, on these sliding plates. This is two ceramic tiles with two pieces of black construction plastic between them, and that plastic is greased, so that's about as slick as you're going to get. This lets the tire move in and out and around with the full weight of the car. And you can see here, to have the full weight of the car, I put it on blocks. The lift is not being used. Here my son is helping me with the rear end alignment. Now I'm going to move on to the third and last and best alignment method that I found. I made this sheet metal channel the width of a wheel and drilled it for two lug locations. And because of the ridge on the drum, you'll have to use a couple of flat washers behind this channel when you bolt it up. I level these to be as accurate as I can, and then I set the rear parking brake. I had this sheet metal channel as the reason I used it, but if I were to buy something, I would buy angle iron, something a little heavier, to eliminate flexing. Now this channel is heavy enough that it won't flex pulling the tape across it as you see here. Very easy to measure front and rear. I also just happen to have two pieces of channel that slide inside each other. I think this was something to do with the bed my son bought. You can use this instead of uh, measuring tape. It works well. Just put it between your two pieces that are bolted to your wheels. And you can see where I put a piece of tape to mark two marks which comes up to about an eighth of an inch. I lined it that way too just to try it out. The only downside with this method is it's easy to flex those side pieces because they're so light and that's why I recommend making them out of angle iron. Most measuring tapes have a little slot in the end where you can hook them over a nail therefore I put a nail on the, each end of these little tools. Makes it so easy for one person to measure accurately without worrying about the tape coming off while you're doing so. So now I've pretty well covered my way of lining up the front and rear. The front is aligned just like the rear, only the front, of course, has to have one eighth toe in, not toe out. And, of course, to adjust that, you loosen the tie rods and turn them 
one way or the other till you get your measurements right. Now, yes, squaring my front end and rear end, squaring it with each other and having the proper alignment did take care of this driving on ice feeling. But I had another problem even before lining it up and getting the twitch out of it. I still had another problem and that was that when you started to go into a curve the car wanted to go straight which uh, is a very uneasy feeling too. Now again I researched online to see if camber would make any difference in the way a car handled as far as oversteer and understeer and I could find nothing so I thought well what the heck I'll give it a shot and see what happens. Again the top of the tires here were tilted out at the top in on the bottom. Using my level and some homemade spacers that wouldn't scratch the wheel I confirmed that. This was a spool that added machine paper came on. Just make two identical spacers that are long enough to clear the hub of the wheel. Now I lowered the car and put the full weight of the car on the wheels to see if it made a difference in this reading and it really didn't seem to. But now on an American car like my Corvette, uh, the weight has to be on the wheels. You can't line it up. It changes too much. Never hang your brake plate from the brake hose. That's a no-no. There are three bolts that holds the brake backing plate to the spindle. Never let the backing plate hang from the brake hose. You do not have to remove the brake hose. Here I have my level against the spindle and I'm checking for uh, vertical. But what I'm going to do is take my sheet metal channel and I'm going to drill two holes in it for the two holes in the spindle here and it'll be vertical and it'll be the width of the wheel and I can put my level against that to be more accurate. Now what I'm shooting for is just to get the wheels perfectly vertical and as you can see by the level bubble here they aren't. To remove the upper and lower link pins you must completely remove these two bolts as shown here. They run against a groove, an adjustment groove on that link pin and you cannot take the link pins out because the bolt captures the link pin. Follow? Once these two bolts have been removed then you can take a small punch and tap that link pin out. Now I'm a fanatic about marking things the way they were so you might want to lay these out so you'll know exactly which link pin goes where. And this photo shows the lower torsion arm loose from the spindle. The link pin has been removed. And of course here the spindle is completely removed. And here is some vital information on uh, your shims and how to measure to see if you have a bent torsion arm on this page. I wasn't too concerned about accuracy this time because I'm in a hurry to get this car ready to drive to Farmington. Then if it handles so much better and it is fixed as far as the uh, not wanting to go through a curve, well then I'll come back and do it again and I'll be more precise because I need to make some more vertical changes. Now look at this spindle to be sure that you've gotten all the shims out. If all the shims are gone, you're going to see this grease groove. If it's smooth, you've got a shim in there. Remove it. As the book says, you should have eight shims total on each link pin. Now this is very important. There's a special shim that goes at the very last on the link pin where it bolts up to the torsion bar. So make sure you have that special washer shown here in red at the top in the right place. Critical. Now you won't need to do this taking it apart but putting it back together you're going to have to use a jack and a something like a 2 before as I've done here to help you put those link pins back in. One thing I found here when taking this apart, and this applies to all cars, not just bugs, the uh, wheel bearing race moved freely on the spindle, the inner wheel bearing race. That should not be. I made some small stake marks with a punch and I cleaned my spindle and my race with a lacquer thinner. And I also use some red Loctite. 
and I drove that bearing race back on the spindle, as you see here. Now, if you ever have a race on a spindle that's worn, needs to be replaced, and it's frozen, I'll tell you how to get that off without damage to the spindle, that is. Using a cutting torch to heat, not to cut, you quickly heat a small area of that race, cherry red, and then smack it with a hammer and a chisel, and it'll become loose enough that it'll come right off without damage to the spindle at all. Now I want to tell you about my method, how I balance tires on a VW. Now this will only work on a VW and cars with very light tires and wheels like a VW has with small wheel bearings. I tried it on my S10 truck and it will not work. Now I have a small bubble balancer from Harbor Freight and it does a fair job, but it won't work on these wheels. First you need to buy some tape weights and these are half ounce and quarter ounce. And I bought these online, but I noticed Harbor Freight has them too. Loosen your front brakes up. And this, by the way, has to be done on the front. You'll have to take your rear wheels and put them on the front in order to balance them. You can't do this on the rear. Loosen the brakes on one of the front wheels. Make sure the wheel bearing adjustment and the brakes are backed off to where the wheel turns freely. Make sure you remove any stones from the uh, tire tread because that'll throw your balance out of course. Now if that tire and wheels is in perfect balance, you'll be able to turn that wheel to any position and it'll stay there. If it's out of balance, of course, the heavy part will slowly drift to the bottom. Then on the opposite side of the wheel, which will be the top, be the lightest part, put a little piece of masking tape there and mark it. Then turn it around where you can get to it and use tape weights, but don't remove the tape from the tape weight. This is to find your balance point first. And you do that by taping a weight or two on there with masking tape until you get it to where you can stop that wheel at any position and it won't move. It'll be perfectly balanced. Then when you have the wheel and tire perfectly balanced, it's time to use the tape weight. Take the tape off the tape weight Clean the wheel and place the weight where you want it. And if I were you, I would double check this before I place the weight to be sure. You can get these weights off, but you're going to ruin them by tearing the tape. So make sure you have it right before you remove the tape on the tape weight. Now I balanced all four tires on my bug this way. And first time out, I got them perfect. Now on a completely different subject, I thought I'd share this with you, how to get a VW pulley off uh, air cool VW. This is a universal pulley puller for an American car. Of course, you see here I used a socket for a spacer. I have two bolts with washers and nuts on the back side. This works real well, or has for me, without bending the stock pulley. This might save you from buying a special tool. And on another subject, after I built this car, the uh, engine paint remained tacky. My paint representative sold me some ALK 200 PPG paint, and he failed to tell me that it had to have a hardener added to it. And I had been away from paint so long, I'd been away from paint for 20 years, so I didn't know. So I had to remove the engine and completely repaint all the engine tin. And this time I used regular PPG black with a hardener. And to my paint rep's credit, he gave me a quart of PPG gloss black to make amends for not telling me about the additive. So a lot of labor, you know, but at least he did the right thing. I couldn't find the answer what to do to clean the new tar boards. And what I did worked out fine. I just used a little Dawn with water, wiped it down, wiped it down again with a just a wet cloth, and used Armor All on it. Works great. Now, you'd have to take some drastic measures on old tar boards, but on new ones, this worked fine. So now all my drivability problems are cured.
And I hope this helps you because this is an extremely hard thing to come up with a solution for online. Mine is the only solution I've seen. I make history videos about our Caldwell County area, so my old 1965 bug fits right in. Thank you.